It's good to see. If you'll take out your message notes, inside we're gonna look at the subject of loving like Jesus in a fractured world. And we've got a special service planned this weekend. My prayer is that this new year will be a whole lot better than last year. We had floods and fires and earthquakes, but we also had shootings and protests and all kinds of things. And it seems like our world, our culture is getting more fractured, more divided, more polarized. Anybody agree with this? Amen. Yeah, it just seems like every, it seems like anger is on the rise. You turn on the TV and it's pundits yelling at each other. And you go on the internet and it's people dissing and demonizing each other. And it just seems like we're, we're more divided, we're more polarized, we're more fractious and fractured uh, than in a long, long time. How are we supposed to react to that? As believers, as followers of Jesus Christ, in, in a fractured world, how are we to be agents of love, agents of unity, agents of harmony and peace? The Bible says this, notice at the top of your outline, 1 Peter chapter two, live as free people. We're, we're to live free, but do not use your freedom as an excuse to do evil. Be servants of God. We're, we're to use our freedom to serve God. And then Peter gives four, this is not all, but four just very specific ways. Number one, treat everyone you meet with dignity. That's the one we're gonna focus on uh, today. Treat everyone you meet with dignity. Love your spiritual family. That's You're to love the church that you're a part of. Revere God and respect the government. By the way, when Peter writes respect the government, Christians were under enormous persecution. They were being killed by the government for their faith. Do you know who the government was when Peter wrote respect the government? Nero. The guy who burned Rome, blamed the Christians. He had clearly was insane. Uh, it was killing... Christians feeding them to the lions. He says, you know, respect, respect the government. Now, I want us to focus on this one, treat everybody you meet with dignity. And we're gonna look at how do you love like Jesus in a fractured world. And today we have a very, very special guest. He's a living legend, Dr. John Perkins. John Perkins is 87 years old. John Perkins was a contemporary of Martin Luther King in the civil rights movement. His brother was shot and murdered by a racist. He was beaten many times, thrown in prison just for being black. And yet while he was in prison, God spoke to him and said, if you retaliate, if you get revenge, you're no better than these people. You need to respond with love. You need to respond with reconciliation. He became the father, the founding father of the Christian reconciliation a movement. And he really is a, a giant. It's an honor to have him here today. Uh, for six decades, he's been at the forefront of bringing people together rather than, than dividing them. He's been a pastor. He's authored a dozen books. In fact, the Christian Publishing Association honored him with the Lifetime Achievement Award for all of the books that he's written about love and unity and things like that. Um, still going strong. You know, he dropped out of school, had to drop, was raised in poverty. In fact, his mother died shortly after his birth from malnutrition. That's how poor they were. And uh, at about the third grade, between third and fourth grade, he had to drop out of school. Yet today, he has been awarded over a dozen doctor's degrees from different universities. And there are schools and universities across America who have named schools, centers and programs after John Perkins. Uh, he's written uh, With Justice for All. He wrote uh, Restoring At-Risk Communities Beyond Charity. He wrote Leadership Revolution, wrote How to Mobilize for the Common Good, How to Make Neighborhoods Whole. His newest book, which I've asked him to sign out on the patio after this service, is called Dream With Me. And it's a fantastic book on the struggle we must win for bringing harmony and unity and love and reconciliation together. So I want you to stand and give a warm saddleback welcome to a living legend, Dr. John Perkins. Wow. <laughs> there you go, man. Amen. Four for four. 
Here we go. Love you. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Have a seat. Yeah. 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 I think they like you. <laughs> I like them too. <laughs> uh, well, you want to say anything before we get started in this interview here? Yeah. Well, uh, you, it would be difficult for you to understand the emotion that's going through me. Mm -hmm. You being there, me being welcome, mm -hmm. you invited me. Mm -hmm. And what thrills me is, is your action in terms of your faith uh, in relationship to the Great Commission. Mm -hmm. uh, a little obedience in the right direction is powerful mm -hmm. because grace and, grace and faith and all of that grow. It's a seed, mm -hmm. but the need to be planting that seed mm -hmm. in obedience to mm -hmm. his commission. Mm -hmm. And that was his commission to take the gospel to all ethnics, all nations, mm -hmm. all tongues mm -hmm. in the world. Mm -hmm. And that you have been doing that. You have accomplished uh, that, which is a beautiful thing. So I'm just absolutely honored to be a part of it. And your, of course, your, your pastor is just wonderful. <laughs> yeah. Oh, talk more about that. Come on. Right. <laughs> yeah, talk a little bit more. <laughs> keep saying. Just yeah, keep going. Is that all you're going to say? No. Well, you know the A in Saddleback. One of our values is all nation congregation, which means not only do we, we're the only church in history to have gone to every single nation through the peace plan. Over 26,000 have gone overseas and served out of this church in every nation, but we also want our church to represent every nation. We may be the most diverse church in America. Uh, we speak 67 languages, and that's why it matters to us about how to love like Jesus in a fractured world. Now, if you look at your message notes, we're gonna cover in this uh, interview five different principles of loving like Jesus. The principle of dignity, the principle of diversity, the principle of community, of love and of reconciliation. And so what I'll just set up each point and then we'll just kind of turn John loose and, and let him uh, hear your 86 years, 87 years of wisdom. The first principle is dignity, write this down. Here's the first principle, if you're gonna love other people, you gotta get this one down. God created every person with dignity. That's the basis of everything we're gonna talk about today. God created every person with dignity the Bible says in Psalm 8, verse 5, God made people just a little lower than the heavenly beings, and he crowned us with glory and honor. That means your dignity comes from God, and the Bible tells us that even Peter didn't know this at the start, the founding apostle, he was a prejudice. He had to learn in Acts 10, verse 28, Peter said, God has shown me that I should never think of anyone as inferior or unclean. And then he says in 1 Peter 2, 17, treat everyone you meet with dignity. John, talk to us about the importance of dignity and why people need to feel it. Yeah. Uh, dignity is the image and the likeness of God. Mm -hmm. We are created in, and then he said, don't make anything else to look like that mm -hmm. but human. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's tied up. It's no wiggle in the room. And we talk about the issue of diversity and race and different. Mm -hmm. If you can't get it dignity, you don't know the problem. Mm -hmm. The problem that in Adam was a sin against God mm. and a sin against his intention and an obedience. Mm. And, and that man was created to reflect God, a looking glass. Mm. You can see God when you see your brothers mm. and your sisters. Mm. And so we had a, and I guess the big issue then, where the initiatives, mm. where do Mm -hmm. The longing, mm -hmm. what are the uh, meaning 
And how do you find that in people? Because if you can find their longing, you can find their meaning. But I think at the fall, I think it was a self-exaltation. Hmm. I think it was an intention of disobedience. And it was an intention to be like what God had already said you was. Hmm. That's how Satan tricked her. Hmm. Creating that doubt that God was telling her the truth mm -hmm. about himself. Mm -hmm. And so dignity is wrapped up in this humanity. For God so loves is dignity. Mm. He, God loves himself, but he wanted to reflect. You don't want to re reflect it in a selfish way. But God was the creator. And so Creation was created, human was created to reflect God and to know God so and to make him known. Everybody's got dignity because we're all created in his image. Right. I've heard you say that you can't give people dignity, uh, you can only affirm it. Affirm it? Affirm, affirm uh -huh. When you hear somebody that you want to stop them, say, mm -hmm. we're giving dignity to people, that's patronizing them. Mm -hmm. That that that's also exalting yourself mm -hmm. unconsciously. Mm -hmm. I'm gi I'm giving what only God can give. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> give them dignity. No, no, you proclaim it. <laughs> mm -hmm. You proclaim it. Mm -hmm. You affirm it that it's there, and that's where racism and bigotry and all that stuff mm -hmm. has a breeding ground. In that kind of stuff. So this is the foundation. If you're going to love people, first you've got to realize that they have as much dignity as you do. You don't have any less than they do, but you don't have any more than they do. Does that make sense? Everybody's got dignity because God created it. You, you can't take it away from them. You can deny it or you can affirm it, as you were just saying. Right, right. So now let's go, to the, let's go to the second principle. And the principle is the principle of diversity. And this is another one you got to understand if you're going to learn to love everybody, and it's this. Write this down. God intentionally created everyone unique. God intentionally created everyone unique. Nobody looks like you. You're not one in a million. You're one in seven billion. And, and God, if you've got a problem with people who are different than you, the problem is you got a problem with God. Racism, prejudice, bigotry, is actually a problem with God. It's saying, God, you screwed up. You should have made everybody like me. <laughs> God is irritated when you have that attitude. And God says, you think I made you the standard of beauty <laughs> or of anything else? Let's look at the verses, and then, John, I want you to talk about, about this. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, God gives everything the kind of body he wants it to have. People, Animals, birds, and fish are each made of flesh, but none of them are alike. Everything in the heavens has a body, and so does everything on earth. But each one is very different from all the others. That's intentional. And then the Bible says in Acts 17, from one man, Adam, God made every nation of men, so we're all from the same blood, and determined the same time, determine the time set for them and the exact places where they should live. God determined who you are, what you are. Talk about that. Well, the source of that diversity, you've explained it. Mm -hmm. It was God's intention mm -hmm. for, for that. It, the, where did it come from is important. It comes out of grace. Mm. Grace is the grace from which all other grace and gifts mm -hmm. come from. Mm -hmm. So it's by the grace of God. Mm -hmm. And in its base anchor in God's love for mankind mm -hmm. within this creation and dignity. Mm -hmm. But it's grace. All good gifts come down from above. All of the talents and all of the different, and so our progress really in our advance as man intelligent and scientific, medical and other behavior comes out of that diversity. Mm -hmm. 
because of the many parts that the body's made up mm -hmm. out of. And he's going to train and give gifts in relationship to those parts so that the whole body can work together in unity. So there's strength in the diversity. Strength in diversity. Yeah. And, and this is a generation that sort of understands that more than ever before mm. because we are in such a global understanding of technology and how that works. Mm -hmm. And your great advances are in teams of six and seven, and when some new mm -hmm. adventure, mm -hmm. it'll be six or seven billionaires at the same mm -hmm. time mm -hmm. because they were working on one piece, mm -hmm. but they were working on the excellent of that gift that God has given them. And he tells us to discover our talent, discover our gifts, and then to use that for the glory of God. Unity in diversity. Mm. And I think that's why he's saying that, that we might be one. Now well, what power, what power we could have if we could become one. Hmm. Yeah. Because and, get, one, we're, we're, and that one is, wait a minute, that yeah, one is, yeah. is original. We've been doing this all day. Yeah, Don't yeah, worry about it. Good. That one is, is original uh -huh. in family. Mm. Mm -hmm. The oneness is in family. Mm -hmm. Oneness is in community. Mm -hmm. So when he said that you might be one, uh, he wasn't thinking about that the oneness was to be within the units mm -hmm. of the family. Mm -hmm. And the church is the steward of that. The church ought to be the equivalent with that. Mm -hmm. And of course, all of God's gifts as it relates to church development or spirituality, it comes from the body, mm -hmm. that he's committed it to the saint mm -hmm. and, and saints within the community of life. You know, in the church, while in the world, people are divided over their differences, they're divided over their diversity, if there ought to be one place in the world where people get along, it ought to be the church. There should be oneness here. Now, I want you to write this down when we talk about diversity. God doesn't want me to be color blind. He wants me to be color blessed. Yes. You can't be color blind. Anybody who says, oh, I'm color blind, is not telling the truth. Because God gave you eyes to see color. Why would God give you eyes to see color and then want you to just not see color? That's nonsense. God does not want you to be color blind. He wants you to be color blessed. In this church, we don't tolerate diversity. We celebrate it. Yes. Because yes. we're stronger. We're yes, stronger. Yes, yes, and, and, you know, last, the other night, you were telling me about, uh, we were talking about how kids, I want you to talk about this, babies and, and little kids, they don't have a problem with diversity. We have to learn to be prejudiced. Talk, talk about that. Yeah, John. Uh, all we got to do is to get a, a sandbox and put all the ethnics in it <laughs> as children, and you would, boy, find some joyful stuff <laughs> taking place. Now, if you try to separate that, you're going to need some sticks, guns, yeah. policemen, signs, yeah. and you're going to have to kill somebody. Jails. If you're going to act to end up genocide mm -hmm. together because we was made to be one. Mm -hmm. The reconciliation we get to is mm -hmm. to bring us back to that human dignity, oneness mm -hmm. in the world. How did you, John, when did you first realize that you had great dignity, and how and where did that come from? How did that come? I, I think my realization mm -hmm. in terms of my enlightenment to do it, mm -hmm. I think came after I came to know Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. And I think it opened up the depths of that. Mm -hmm. But now as I look at my life as it opened up and then find out where those sparks were, and that's what you asked me, mm -hmm. where are the sparks? Mm -hmm. I guess one of the time a spark, when I was about 12 years old, I worked a whole day for a white man. We were sharecroppers. That's one step up from slavery. Mm -hmm. And that didn't break until 1965 and 64 with the vote of the right. We was not considered as human beings in America. Couldn't vote. One person, one vote. Yeah. Yeah. We became persons. Mm -hmm. You know, your know, people start talking about that. Mm -hmm. uh, this, that, and that, and making comparison. Yeah. 
holding people in slavery, it would have to be the worst because that's the picture of salvation. Hmm. What you know about salvation came out of Israel being captive in, in, in Egypt. And that was body, soul, and spirit. Mm -hmm. And so slavery in America was one of the worst it's ever been because it color-coded people. Mm -hmm. When you color code people and brand them, mm -hmm. if it's the right brand, you got something going. Mm -hmm. This was the wrong brand. Mm -hmm. It was branded on hate. But now, you, you can feel bad, but that ain't no problem with God because that's why he came. Mm. He came to save his people from their sin. Mm. The problem is we're so proud with it that we won't confess it. Mm. Confessing is the way to righten all wrongs. Because mm. when we confess our sin, mm -hmm. he's faithful. I, I think that's because I'm not here playing a race game. Mm -hmm. I'm not here pitting one group against another one. Mm -hmm. I would be denying the dignity, our, prim, our foundation here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and boy, people, we're at a beautiful spot. Mm -hmm. We don't try to lot. We try the civil war. We try the civil rights movement. We try the war on poverty. And poverty won, that's the big one, <laughs> in, 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 in life. It's getting worse. Yeah. It's getting worse. It's getting worse because it's becoming more acute because the rich is getting so much richer. So yeah. much richer. You, you, you understand? In life. Yeah. What was the question again? So the answer. <laughs> <laughs> I like the answer. That was great. I like well, the answer. <laughs> the, point, the point he was just making is the antidote is not a program. It's person, Jesus right. Christ. Now, the way you came to Christ was through your son. And Spencer was a, a little boy and he was going to a, a good news club and he came home singing songs and you, coming out of Mississippi and all that racism of the 40s and 50s, heard him singing songs that did not match your reality. Talk right. about that. See, see, I'm not from a typical, I'm not the typical black Pentecostal or Baptist, you know, <laughs> and no, don't think I'm from the conservative uh, <laughs> right and left wing. I wasn't from that. That's mm. white folks stuff. We got our own stuff. You know, we, got, <laughs> we got old, old stuff, so I didn't come from that. And, and so we was bootleggers and gamblers. Bootleggers. That was my... Yeah. Family. That's a denomination Background. I'd like to be a part so, of. So, 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 so when I so when I left after my brother was killed, went to California. I went to California, and I became an eight, at 18 and grew up there, and started my family. When the Korean War came mm -hmm. out, mm -hmm. got my family started mm -hmm. in Southern California, Monrovia, right over from Pasadena. Mm -hmm. uh, there, growing up. Uh, there, my, we bought our nice house in this new, this open housing was just coming, and we could break out of the ghetto. Mm. And, uh, and of course, we was not fixing to start this short period of integration. We're gonna get rid of that baby. Uh, integration is that period between when the first black move in and the last white move out. That's what it was. It was a short period. It didn't like, we got rid of that baby quick. <laughs> now we got another one. Uh, gentrification. We got, we got that one going gentrification, now. Gentrification, so, yeah. uh, uh, so, so what happened? They started, uh, they had some good news clubs. And, and it worked. Uh, people in the community that know Jesus Christ. And basically these white ladies. Mm -hmm. And the community was changing. And, and, and they were, if you could reach those kids when they're young and bring them together, mm -hmm. they would accept Christ and love each other. Mm -hmm. And so my son ended up going to it. Uh, one of the teachers of it opened up a class in our home, mm -hmm. and that family mm -hmm. is a member of this church All right here now. That was way back there. They was up in that part then. And, uh, they, and Spencer would come home, you, 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 you know. I grew up without a mother. I grew up without a father. Mm -hmm. I grew up without the institution of love. Mm -hmm. And so a certain degree, my father gave us away. While he still loved us, I know, and he came to visit me from time to time, but, but he never took me back. 
into, their, into his home. Mm. And so we grew up that way. My grandmother gave away the rest of the children. And, uh, and so I, uh, I, I, I want you to know that because there's that, uh, that hole in your heart and other people's heart. And that love mm -hmm. is for love. Mm -hmm. When you say the family is broken down, and that's what it is in my neighborhood, mm -hmm. you're talking about a tragedy. Mm -hmm. You're talking about a tragedy. Mm -hmm. And so I came from that broken family, mm -hmm. aching for love. And so my son got him, got Vera May. Mm -hmm. It began in my family now, is a family of love. Mm -hmm. It became a family of love. And so he went to this good news club and he heard about Jesus. And he began to come back to the house singing these new songs, new to me. Anyway, they had to be new. He was singing it. Good news, good news, Christ died for me. Good news, good news. If you would. That's what the gospel is. Mm -hmm. It's the greatest news that ever been mm -hmm. told, that there is redemption from our sin, mm -hmm. that we can have our sins forgiven. Mm -hmm. He was singing those songs. And then the one that caught my attention, based on my background, was this one. I come from one of the separate waiting rooms here, separate sign there, mm -hmm. a separate get your food there, mm -hmm. and uh, mm -hmm. call it here. Mm -hmm. And if a white person walked on the street and the street was narrow, we had to step on the, on the side to mm -hmm. let them go. But I come, that's my background, mm -hmm. that racism in Mississippi. And then he came home singing his song like this. Jesus loves the little children. Mm. All the children of the world. Red, brown, and yellow, black and white. They all are precious. This was good news. Mm. <sighs> this is good news. Mm. Sometimes people ask me now, they'll say, oh, when did you join the civil rights movement? And I about die. <laughs> I, I wouldn't think that people could ask me that ignorant a question. Mm -hmm. Who did you join mm -hmm. something that to set you free? Mm -hmm. Who did you have to join something? Mm -hmm. That's making too big an assumption upon mm -hmm. humanity. Mm -hmm. That I don't want to be free. Mm -hmm. Human being was born with dignity. Mm -hmm. Dignity cries out mm -hmm. from the ground. So why did I have, well, he shared and invited me to go. It's a big story in my book, uh, Dream With Me. It's a big story. I read it this morning about that idea. And, and then he invited me to go with him to the uh, Good News Club, to the Sunday school. And it was through that that I, in a little holiness church, I read this verse of scripture that got to my heart. I was born by the word of God. Mm -hmm. that, it was a fulfillment of my longing. Galatians 2, 2. It was about racism. Mm -hmm. It was about bigotry. That's what Galatians is about. Putting anything else before God. Christ is the solid rock of salvation. Now here at that verse, I have, Paul was giving his own testimony mm. in the light of racism. Mm -hmm. He was saying, I have been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but it's Christ who lives in me. The Christian life is the outliving of the inliving Christ. It is Christ in us, the hope of glory. Nevertheless, I live, yet not me, but Christ lives in me. And the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith and of course, you could say, the gra and the grace of the Son of God mm. who loved me. Mm. That's it. Who loved me and gave himself for me. And I know this was God. I said, Jack, if, if there's a God in heaven mm. that loved me enough to send his son, like Spencer, into the world to die for me, I want to know that God. Amen. Amen. I want to know that God. That's some, I think that's where you got to get to. Yeah. But that happened. Notice it happened in community. Yes. Oh he, yeah. had, he, he, he wasn't just out there on his own. There were a group of people who surrounded him 
and shared that love. Oh yeah, and, 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 and that's the key. We'll get to that one. Mm -hmm. We'll come, come to next. that one. That's, that's, the, that's the key. Mm -hmm. uh, the gospel is committed to the saints, Plural. to a collective group of people, mm -hmm. is to be in unity and seeking to be in unity mm -hmm. with God mm -hmm. and with each other. With that as the major intention, so that they can make other people know God by the extent that we can tell them that we know God. Mm. That's what it's about, to know God and to make this God known to the world. All right, let's go to this third principle of how to love like Jesus. First, dignity. Everybody was made in God's image, so they all matter to God. Second, diversity. God intentionally didn't make everybody like you. There's nobody like you. And when you get to heaven, it's going to be diversity. If you don't like diversity, you're going to hate heaven. Yeah, yes, yes. Because they're not all going to look like you there, all right? Everybody. Now we come to the third principle, which is community, which we just start talking about. Here's the principle. Write it down. The principle of community is we need each other. Mm -hmm. We need each other, and we're better together. Yeah. God never intended for you to go through life by yourself, on your own, lonely, and without the support of other people. And he wants other people of diversified backgrounds in your life. I wrote a chapter on this in Purpose Driven Life called You're Formed for a Family, that we're made for community. Let me read you a couple verses and we'll talk about this. Ephesians chapter three says this, verse four to six. In the past, no one knew God's secret plan. God has had a secret plan for the universe. But now, the Holy Spirit has revealed it. And this is the plan. Here's the plan. That through the gospel, that's the good news of Jesus dying and rising again, which John was just talking about, everybody, both Jews and non-Jews, if you're not a Jew, you're a non-Jew, that's all of us, both everybody, are, is now, they're now invited to be members together in the body of Christ and to share together God's promises. God wanted a family, but he wanted it diversified. And he wanted it to come from every tribe and every nation, and that's what the peace plan's all about. And in Hebrews 2, verse 11, Jesus and his people, Jesus and the people he makes holy, all belong to the same family. And that's why he isn't ashamed to call them his brothers and sisters. We're brothers and sisters. John, Talk to us about what is real community? Real, real community is a new birth brother and sisterhood mm -hmm. based on being born again in the family of God. He mm -hmm. gives us the right to become the sons of God. Mm -hmm. I mean, John, it, when John says that, he says it with the greatest emotion. Beloved. What manner of love is this mm -hmm. that we can be called mm -hmm. the sons of God? Mm -hmm. And he said, that's what you are right now. Mm -hmm. How is that expressed? Mm -hmm. I think that's what we want to know. How is that expressed? Mm -hmm. It's expressed in friendship. Mm -hmm. Friendship within community. Friendship within the neighborhood. Loving your neighbor as you love yourself. Mm -hmm. It's the fulfillment of the great commandment to love God mm -hmm. with all of your heart and all of your strength, and to love that Samaritan who you hate, and he can hate you back as well, mm -hmm. you, 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 you know. And so those people that were former enemies, but it's within the context, and we got to understand this, it's, and you, you, you said this before, it's bigger than your birth family. Mm -hmm. Jesus put that as a landmark. When he was doing his evangelism, he was busy reaching those that were lost. And those who were coming to faith was becoming his brothers and sisters, his own family come outside. And he said, let them wait a while because these are my brothers and these are my sisters, mm -hmm. these who have put their faith in Jesus Christ, mm -hmm. who have become sons and daughters of God uh, in, in our society. So it's that friendship. Uh, Abraham is the founder of our faith. And what he found was friendship with the most high God. Mm -hmm. Abraham was the friend of God. That's what the Bible friend says. Friend of God. Mm -hmm. He became a friend of God. Mm 
And that was a time. That was a time in the life. The, the disciples, he gets those 12 ragged disciples, apostles. He's going to make them apostles. He's going to make them apostles. He's going to make them responsible for the church hmm. to create the church uh, in the world. But it says something that they became, Jesus said, I'm not going to call you disciples no more. I'm going to call you friends. Mm -hmm. We know what each other's doing. Mm -hmm. We're in the community. Mm -hmm. We have found the will of God and the will of God that we might know him and know each other and become brothers and sisters in this. This is separate from the other. Mm -hmm. I think we get our political, social, and we should do all that we can. I'm not against nothing. I'm not walking around. You don't find John Perkin against too much. <laughs> I lack an addition or a new beginning. Mm -hmm. I lack an addition mm -hmm. because when you tell people to stop something, mm -hmm. it's negative. Mm -hmm. They got to learn how to stop it mm -hmm. because you are they're addicted to what they're doing and it takes some recovery time mm -hmm. to come out of that. Mm -hmm. uh, and like, so it's the family. It's that family. Okay, so let's talk about this. And family and friendship. Family and friendship. Friendship and, and fellowship are similar, right? Same thing. Okay. All right. So friend, friend, it, fellowship is how you nurture it. We, this is fellowship. What? Nurture it. Nurture it. Okay. Got it. How we disciple it. Right. Same thing. Right. right. Discipline it. Right. And this is, that's what we're doing this morning. We, we are disciplined our fellowship. Okay. So we're in a world that's fracturing, more and more polarized, more and more divided more and more separated, more and more fragmented. If there ought to be one place there's unity and community, it should be in the church. We should be the place that models what love is all about. That we come from all different kind of backgrounds and somehow we manage to all love each other and work together. Now, if you are a follower of Christ, that means everybody else who's a follower of Christ is your brother and your sister. Yes. That puts them in a closer relationship than other people. So for instance, if you are a black woman and you love the Lord, you're my sister. If you are an Asian woman and you love Jesus Christ, you are my sister. Which means that my relationship to you is closer than my relationship to some other white guy who doesn't know the Lord. Does that make sense? Yes. yes. You see, you gotta figure out where you're gonna get your primary identity. From God or from politics or something else? You can say, I'm an American, but you're not gonna be an American for all of eternity. That's just a short time you've got that label. You might say, I'm a, and name a political party, but you're not gonna carry that political party into heaven. You might say, I'm a, name your career or whatever. What you're carrying into heaven is your relationship not only to God, but to each other. And so that, pri that should take priority over others, which means this. If a white man starts criticizing or making fun of my Asian sister or my African-American sister, you got a problem with me because she's my sister. And I actually have a closer relationship to her than I do you, do you as another white man. Does that, you get that? You gotta decide where your primary identity is gonna be. I highly recommend you not put your identity in something that isn't gonna last past this life. That's right, oh yeah, that's powerful. If in this life only, if in this life well, only you have hope. We, we, we identify with, this is my politics, this is my music, this is my, what, this is my these are my homeboys, this is my, none of that's gonna last, friends. Right. None of that's gonna last. But the fact is that you're my brother or you're my sister and Christ is our brother and we're in the fatherhood. That's big. Now I've heard you say that racism hurts everybody. What do you mean by that? Oh, it damaged white folks on the provision, uh, the over dignifying uh, their whiteness. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and, and so it mm -hmm. damaged them mm -hmm. and they, they can see compassion mm -hmm. once they get in it. Mm -hmm. And so everybody can do that. Mm -hmm. We all got that capacity mm -hmm. to do that. Uh, and and, and, and on the, 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 I've, I've come to the bottom line of it. Who do we kill? 
because that's finality. Mm. That was a comparison we made with Cain and Abel. Mm. That's where it starts at mm. in life. So it's in our who we kill. Black folk are killing black folk one by one in Chicago mm. and other major cities mm. like they, now, I know my black folks say, oh, mm. that sounds good. Mm. That's good. White folks are killing white folks in bunches with machine guns. They're going to schools, mm -hmm. killing each other. Vegas. Vegas. Yeah. I, what we're saying is we're broken. We're all broken. Let's don't play this game. Mm. Let's don't play this game. We're all like sheep have gone astray. Mm -hmm. We turn each one racial, ethnicity, mm -hmm. to our own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, we have got to come back. Uh, yes, we're creating God's image. We are broken. He came to restore us. Mm -hmm. And boy, the joy ought to be, he came to take you and me and that we can join in his redemptive world. We can join in healing this world. Mm -hmm. Oh, God. Well, let, let me read this verse, because it goes right yeah. along with what he just said. He said, we can, we can join together in healing the world. Here's what the Bible says in James chapter 3, verse 18. You can develop a healthy, robust community that lives right with God and enjoys the results. We'll all be happier. Only if you do the hard work. And here's what it says, the hard work of getting along with each other and treating each other with dignity mm. and honor, mm. okay? Now, how do we do that? Well, let's look at the next principle. It's love. Mm. We do it in love, because that's what it's talking about. Here's the principle of love, write it down. We were put on this earth to learn how to love. We were put on this earth by God to learn how to love. Have you ever wondered why God doesn't just create you and take you to heaven automatically? Why does he put you here first? If God ultimately wants you in heaven forever and ever and ever and ever, why does he first put you on planet earth for 60, 70, 80, 90, 100 years in sorrow, suffering, sickness, sadness, suffering? Why didn't he just take you to heaven first? You're put here to learn how to love. As John said earlier, Jesus summarized the whole Bible in the great commandment. Love God with all your heart, love your neighbor. It's all about relationships. If you don't learn how to love God and you don't learn how to love people, you miss the purpose of being on this planet. Because he said, I, I put you here for two things, to learn to love God and learn to love each other. And here's what Jesus said about love. I give you a new commandment. This is John 13, 34 and 35. I give you a new commandment. You must love each other. Now here's the hard part. In the same way that I have loved you. How does Jesus Christ love you? Unconditionally, freely, repeatedly, without hesitation. Instantly, you must love each other in the same way that I have loved you. Your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. He doesn't say your bumper sticker on your car will prove that you're my disciple. <laughs> now, the way you prove that you are truly a follower of Jesus, that you're truly in the family of God, is this. You love everybody. That's and that, the mark. And, and that love will bear fruit mm. And that is the more enablement and the gifts that cause you to love more. Hmm. That's called the fruit of the Spirit, hmm. love, joy, perseverance, mm -hmm. and all of these. Mm -hmm. And Peter said, if they be in you mm -hmm. and remain, you will become mm -hmm. fruitful. Mm -hmm. And the first fruit would be in the knowledge of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. The knowledge that you are in him. Mm -hmm. The knowledge that he's our savior. And that we're serving him. And that he's our shepherd. He's our shepherd. Mm -hmm. We'll grow in those areas of life. So when it comes to love, and love in the family of God, have, by the way, have you ever, I'm, I'm saying, I mentioned this already, your commitment to your brothers and sisters in Christ should be greater than your commitment to anything else. Yes. 
because it's not going to last. Have you ever heard the expression, blood is thicker than water? Ever heard that? Blood is thicker than water? Well, first place, it's not true. Uh, it, it's not true in the, in the metaphor. And what I mean by that is this. First, we've all got the same kind of blood. Since we all came from Adam, whether you are a black soldier or a brown soldier or an Asian soldier or a white soldier, when you bleed on the field, you bleed red. We all have the exact same kind of blood. It may be O type, A, B, or whatever, but that has nothing to do with your ethnic background. And so the whole idea, wh wh whose blood are you talking about? Your blood is the same blood as everybody else around the world. But it's also not true, and they say blood is thicker than water. It's not true if the water is baptism. Let me explain what I mean by that. If you've been baptized and you're a follower of Christ, then you're now in a different family. And that family relationship is closer than even your own family. Because it's gonna last forever. So in that love relationship, John, you've talked about how we need a new language of love. Yes, yes this is, see we have wrapped our faith, whatever, mm -hmm. our personhood mm -hmm. and our dignity. Mm -hmm. We have wrapped that round with our own individual human philosophies of life. And, and, and we think that that adds to my dignity. Mm -hmm. What does that look like? I'm a conservative, I'm a liberal, mm -hmm. I'm a Democrat, I'm a Republican, I am this. All of those are gonna, and we done divided those up too. Mm -hmm. And so we can't speak. When I listen to you, I meet you. I'm listening to disagree with you. That breeds hate. Mm. And this was the first election that was won on hate. Mm. I don't care who won. Mm. I don't care who won. Don't, don't hit me with that. Mm. This is the first time. <laughs> uh, this is the first time of that. So, and so hate is winning. Mm. Dislike. It's, it, the genie is out of the box. Mm. What we got to do now is find out how can we embrace each other? Mm. How can we affirm the dignity of each other? Mm -hmm. How can we say, hi, how do you feel today? Mm -hmm. What you got on your mind to do today? Mm -hmm. Could I help you? We got, we, got to, we, can't, we got to affirm. Okay, let's talk about that. If we're in a world where it's getting more polarized, more divided, more hatred against each other, more demonization, tomorrow morning you're gonna get up and you're gonna go to work. And you're gonna work, most likely, or go to school with people who are very different than you. How do you be an agent of love with those people? How do, you show, how do I show love the people who are different from me. I'm gonna give you four words. I want you to write these yes. words down. This is very practical. Here's how you can show the love of Jesus to people you totally disagree with, or totally different from, or totally it's a different religion, or lifestyle, or whatever. Here's how you show love to those people. Number one, write this word, they're all L words. First one is listen. When you listen to someone, you're showing love to them. The most powerful love organ in your body is your ear. You thought I was gonna say something else. <laughs> but it's not. The most powerful love organ in your body is your ear. When you listen to people, you're giving them the words, uh, the ability to talk to you, and you're treating them with the dignity they deserve. So listening is actually loving people. When you listen, number two, look at them. Listen to them. Look at them, look at them in the eye. When you give people your attention, you're giving them the most important thing you've got, your time. You can always get more money, but you can't get more time. So if I give you my time, I'm giving you a part of my life, I'm never gonna get it back. The greatest gift, dads, you can give your children or your wife is your time. Say, so I give them all, all these gifts, what do they want? They want you. When you look people in the eye, you're saying, you matter to me. When you look people in the eye, you're saying, I love you. So you listen and you look. The third thing you do is you learn. You can learn from anybody. 
if you know the right questions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Everybody's ignorant just on different subjects. Mm -hmm. You know some things I don't know, the person next to you knows some things they don't know, and on, everybody on your row could teach you. In fact, if I had 15 minutes with you, you would teach me something. Why? Because you know things I don't know. The Bible says counsel or wisdom in the heart of man is like a deep well, but a man of understanding will draw it out. You gotta know how to draw out the water. How do you draw it out? With questions. I used to keep in my wallet a series of questions every time I'd get around anybody like John and I'd ask him these same questions. What books have influenced your life? What's been, what pain has influenced your life? What's been a high point in your life? And I ask these questions. You can learn from anybody. And when you listen and you look and you learn, you are loving that person. Here's the fourth thing that's gonna surprise you. Laugh. Laugh with them. Humor is a great equalizer. Humor can be an evidence of love. Humor lowers tension. The word humor and the word humility come from the same word humus, which means of the earth, a salt of the earth, a people from the ground. They're, they're good rooted people. When you, the mark of humility is your ability to laugh at yourself. Mm -hmm. If you laugh at yourself, you'll mm -hmm. have plenty of friends. Mm -hmm. And if you laugh at yourself, you will never run out of material. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but when you are in a room with somebody in conflict, and if you can find something to laugh about, something together, that is humanizing. And when you listen, and you look, and you learn, and you laugh, that's called equals love. You can do this. Now this brings us to the fifth of the um, principles, the principle of reconciliation. And John, I'll, I'll set this up, then I want you to bring us home on it. Yeah, I, I, I like you to add, I, sure, I want to add a little to this sure. powerful listen, and you'll find. Oh, did you hear that? <laughs> Write that one down. Listen. This powerful yeah, listening. Mm -hmm. And that, because uh, that's the first commandment. <clears throat> Hear, O Israel. O Israel. Mm -hmm. So listening mm -hmm. is that gauge. Mm -hmm. What does that look like? It looks like prayer. Wow. Write that down. Listening prayer is prayer. Is listening for God's will so you can do it, your will be done mm -hmm. on earth mm -hmm. as it is in heaven. Mm -hmm. Who is the prophet in the Bible mm -hmm. of listening, mm -hmm. of, the, of, the pra of prayer? Who is the prophet of prayer? Elijah. Mm -hmm. When was this fulfilled? It was tested with the false gods. And that's the first one you want to get rid of. Mm. False gods. After he took care of that, it didn't rain until he said so. Mm. But when he got ready, he finished, obeyed God, done his will. Mm -hmm. uh, what is next? He went to the mountain to find out. He went to the mountain to pray. He went to the mountain to listen to God's will. Jesus got up in the morning and he went to the mountain. He was alone. He was getting ready for his day's work, or his day's work. In life. He wanted to know the will of God. The will of God is everything. And, the, and that's the one that says instant all the time. You pray all the time. You pray all the time. You listen, you listen, you listen. God, what is your will uh, for my existence? Mm -hmm. That's for my life. But what is your will for me individually, too? <laughs> Knowing his big one is first. Mm -hmm. Knowing his big one mm -hmm. is the first. And it's from knowing his big one, then you add those little ones, those day-by-day -day prayer. Mm -hmm. You anchor them. They are the wraparound. So this is how this works. When you're, you're getting ready to talk to somebody who's different than you, or yes. you disagree with on something, and you're trying to be loving toward them, and you're doing those four L's, but John just added this one, and he said, while you're listening, you're praying at the same time. Here's how this works. 
The average person speaks 250 words a minute. Your brain can process about 500 words a minute, which leaves a 250 word per minute boredom factor, <laughs> which is why you can be listening to me right now and thinking about the ball game or where you're going to lunch. And I, I get that. You, yeah, you can is. carry on to left. And you can talk to somebody and be thinking about something else at the same time, right? Of course you can. So you can pray. When you're, taught, when you're listening and you're looking and you're learning and you're laughing, you're also praying. And you're saying, God, help me to hear this person what they're really saying so I can learn from them. And God, help me to know what to say back which treats them with the dignity they deserve. Does that make sense? Yeah. So that's how prayer becomes a part. That's right. All right, let's go, right to the, let's go to this fifth principle. The fifth principle of loving like Jesus is the principle of reconciliation. Now, you know what reconciliation means. It's when you get two people who are fighting each other to come together. When people reconcile instead of getting a divorce, they've come back together. When you reconcile your bank book, you, all of a sudden you make sure that it matches what the bottom line is. The Bible says this, 2 Corinthians 5, 18. God has restored our relationship to himself. That's reconciliation. He has restored our relationship to himself through what Jesus Christ did for us, dying for our sins. Now he's given us the work of helping other people restore their relationship to God and everyone else. You may not know this, but the Bible says if you're a follower of Jesus, you are a minister of reconciliation. You are, a minister, you are an agent uh, of reconciliation. And it is your job to, to be a harmonizer, a peacemaker. In fact, Jesus said this, blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called the children of God. Now here's the principle, write this down. If we're not helping people reconcile, we're not the church. If we're not helping people reconcile, we're not the church. We're not the children of God because blessed are the peacemakers. They will be called the children of God. The one thing that we should be known for is those people over there at Saddleback, they help people solve their, their conflict. They help people get back together. They help people learn to love each other. And you're gonna have this opportunity this week to be an agent of reconciliation. Because I guarantee you this next week there'll be a conflict in your life, maybe eight or nine on Monday. <laughs> and what you do with that will determine whether you're doing what God has called you to do as a follower of Jesus or not. You are to be, to take those conflicts in the world and go, hey, let's kind of calm this down here and let's show how we can reconcile together. Talk about yeah, that. Yeah, as I will listen. Uh, it, reconciliation is ongoing continually. Hmm. Reconciliation is evangelistic hmm. because you're bringing them back together as a peacemaker hmm. or you're putting them in the hands of Jesus Christ hmm. who is a savior hmm. who get rid of our sin. Hmm. And so reconciliation, that's our work. Hmm. He has given us, he has made us ambassadors. So we are, in fact, peacemakers, and it's ongoing. It's, it's more than an event. It might be an event at the connection, but now you're becoming a minister, and that's everybody. It all comes I, back to relationships, doesn't it? That, that, that holds it together. Friendship. That's how, that holds the friendship together. Mm -hmm. That holds the friendship together. Mm -hmm. So reconciliation is one of those, what we call them, wraparound. Mm -hmm. You know, one of those, God wants to be something or do something, what wraps that around? What makes it possible for us to do it? Mm -hmm. you, you know, what is the gift we need to make that possible? Isn't that beautiful? Isn't that Amen. beautiful? That God has provided. And boy, the big one, is the forgiveness of sin. I run on that one every day. People hold their hurt like they got something to bless. Hmm. They hold it as a whipping rod. Hmm. I'm not going to forgive you because I want to hate you tomorrow. <laughs> 
And so it's going to be easier for me to pile that one up on top of another one and let that one turn to more malice. That's why he tells us as soon as we know it that we need forgiven, to be forgiven. Let's go both ways. And if I've been forgiven, then I'm going to be more forgiving of you. Yes. If I felt God's grace, I'm going to be more gracious. Yes. When I don't feel forgiving of you, it's because I don't feel forgiven. So you've got to feel God's forgiveness first. If you will become an agent of forgiveness, if you'll become an agent of reconciliation, if you'll become an agent of love, in this world, you're going to have job security. Right. Because you the world that. needs people who know how to reconcile. We're gonna close with a song. I want you to listen to the words too, but I want you to give a warm thank you to Dr. John Perkins. Yeah. Thank you so much. This is great. This is great. This is great. Thanks for checking out this message on YouTube. My name is Jay and I'm Saddleback's online campus pastor and I would love to invite you to join our online community. Here are three ways you can take a next step. First, Learn more about belonging to our church family by completing Class 101 online. Second, don't do life alone anymore by getting into an online-only small group that meets on platforms like Skype, or learn more about hosting a group with your friends in your home. Third, join our global Facebook community to connect with others with the online community and be more engaged in the day-to-day. -day. To take any of those next steps, visit saddleback.com online or email online at saddleback.com. Hope to hear from you soon.